Hi guys, welcome back. This is Match Hat episode 152, featuring a retrospective of one of the greatest adventure games of all time, Grim Fandango. This game has been in the news a lot lately because its creators have launched a very successful Kickstarter project to bring this style of game back to modern games. Very exciting stuff, and I thought it was a really great time to look back at this classic. So without further ado, here is Grim Fandango. And here we go, folks, with a retrospective of one of the greatest adventure games of all time. A little thing by Tim Schafer. I think you've probably heard of it. Grim Fandango! Sorry for the wait, Mr. Flores. I am ready to take you now. Take me? Take me where? Now, now. There's no need to be nervous. Nervous? No. It's just your appearance. It's a little intimidating. Intimidating? Me? But I'm your friend. My name's Manny Calavera. I'm your neutral. Now, this is a game with a really interesting history development uh, story. I mean, everything about this game is really interesting. Uh, one of the things that's interesting about it was, even though it was uh, critically acclaimed, almost all of the gaming magazines and websites at the time had nothing but praise for this game. It nevertheless uh, was considered a commercial failure by LucasArts. I mean, it's not like this game was a Duke Nukem Forever style bomb, uh, folks, but it just didn't make a, a, the, the money, I guess, uh, that LucasArts was expecting it to make. So some people uh, credit this game with not only the demise of LucasArts Adventure Games Division, uh, which they promptly closed after this. I think they might have made maybe one other game. Uh, but the subsequent uh, collapse of, you know, Sierra had, had was gone too, and LucasArts was gone. The, the only people making adventure games at this point were relatively minor... Uh, companies. So some people, in other words, some people credit Grim Fandango with the the uh, demise of the entire adventure games uh, genre, uh, which I think is a little unfair. But anyway, it, this is uh, a very unusual setting we're looking at here. I'll just read you a little bit from the manual. And by the way, like a lot of these games I reviewed, if you haven't, if you, if you, if it's at all possible, get a boxed copy of this thing, or at least download the PDF. Uh, version of the manual because it's really good, really colorful, uh, well-produced manual here. Uh, but they say that the Land of the Dead in Grim Fandango, I'm quoting here, is a blend of images from Mayan and Aztec art, Mexican folklore, and film noir of the 1930s, 40s, and 50s. Uh, so this is a, a really exotic setting. It's I don't remember ever seeing any uh, other game with a quite a <laughs> setting anything like this. No thanks, you dead and no commission low life cases like yours, Menso. Hey Manny, the boss told me to tell you not to leave early tonight. He wants to talk to you about something when he gets back from his trip. Tell Don not to worry. I'm not going anywhere. Now let me just say here, folks, that this retrospective will by practically by necessity have lots of spoilers in it. I just don't know how to uh, show you the game without spoiling some of the early stuff. However, it's a uh, you know, big enough game that uh, seeing a few of the puzzles I don't think is really going to uh, turn you off the game or, or ruin it for you. But I'll just throw that out there now. <laughs> if you, if you uh, want a completely virginal experience playing this, uh, then just stop the video, play the game, and then come back later. And this game was built with something called the Grim E engine. Like uh, this was a new engine. It was the first uh, engine that LucasArts had for these adventure games. It would give you 3D uh, graphics. It's basically what we're looking at here is uh, 3D graphics overlaid against a pre-rendered static background. It's basically the same thing as Alone in the Dark, uh, which I reviewed a long time ago. Right, you boneheads! Thank you, lucky stars, and get to your friggin' cars! We have a mass poisoning on our hands! Too many dead to assign specific cases, so all clients are first come, first serve! So let's see some hustle out there! You know, something else that's really weird about this game, actually, is the the, the, the uh, control scheme is based on the gamepad and joystick. Even though uh, you can play this with a keyboard, and a lot of people do, um, I've played it both ways. And actually, today was the first time I'd actually tried the, the gamepad to play this with. And it, it's so much better <laughs> when you control it that way. You know, at LucasArts must have known that most of the people that played this would not have a gamepad. And they didn't release a version for the then uh, very popular PlayStation 1 system. And if they could get Final Fantasy VII on the PlayStation, I don't see why this would have been that big of a stretch. You know, but <laughs> I'm, not a, I'm not a programmer, so what do I know? 
Uh, but nevertheless, uh, it, it's really a shame to me that they had gone to all this trouble to create this adventure game interface that works so well with nothing but a gamepad. <laughs> you never saw it, saw this on any of the consoles. I didn't expect... The sales agents usually don't come over to this part of the garage. I'm Calavera. Manny Calavera. My name's Gladys. I don't get many visitors. Hey! I got a message for a Mr. Calavera. Uh... The driver said that Mr. Hurley said that he could have the rest of the day off. Domino sent my driver home? Yeah, wasn't that nice? You know, I love this character, Gladys. He's one of my, my favorite in the game. One of my favorite characters of all time. A really unforgettable uh, character and a great performance by a relatively obscure actor, uh, Alan Blumenfeld. At least I'd never heard of him. He's, he's played a dad in a couple of uh, pretty well-known TV shows, Heroes. And uh, the main character, Manny, is voiced by Tony Plana. Now, this is a pretty interesting guy. You know, I had never heard of him before either, but I was looking at his entry on Wikipedia. He's actually directed and acted in some episodes of uh, Deep Space Nine, which is really cool. He's done some, some other stuff, but, I mean, if you've done Star Trek, you're pretty cool <laughs> already. He's also did some uh, Shakespeare stuff, so... I really like to see uh, learn more about him. He did a great job in, in this game for sure. You're not too big. You just have a self-image problem. A what? Repeat after me. I am not fat. I am thin. Women find me attractive. Hey, I never said I was too fat for the ladies. Just the cars. The ladies like me just fine. <laughs> Good old Gladys. Now, there's a lot going on here story-wise. And, and, again, I'm in that predicament of I can't really explain too much to you about what's going on because that would ruin a lot of the experience uh, that of learning it on your own. You know, as you play the game, you'll learn about, uh, for example, what a demon is and the role they play in this world versus uh, who the, you know, the skeletons are and how they got there and such. Probably the first time you play this, you'll spend a good part of the first part of the game just like, what the hell is going on in my... Am I dead? Am I in hell, heaven, uh, purgatory? You know, what is this place? What are the rules? Uh, but it all uh, comes together and makes a lot of sense. And it's actually a very compelling and really interesting game world. It's the festival of the Day of the Dead. Really more of a living person's holiday, but we play along. Hey, what's going down, clown? The back off suit. I'm practicing. Practicing what? Ring in your neck. What does it look like? Me up one of the, the music for this game was composed by Peter McConnell. And I was just on Amazon. I saw where they you could buy. They actually released the soundtrack. There's one copy for sale right now. I used copy for only $119. <laughs> so I guess if you're really a hardcore fan, you'll have that too. Just a box copy of the game is anywhere from... 50 well on up to hundreds of dollars i guess for something in immaculate condition like, you know i guess that's not that bad considering a game as good as this is worth two of any new game so you know, do the math i won't go into detail about how to acquire the game by other means other than to say it's it's, it's very easy to do and then there's a custom installer you can find for free that'll put it on your windows 7 uh, 64-bit system, but with absolutely no hassle. You can play it full screen or windowed uh, versions. It's actually actually quite nice. <laughs> uh, so even though you can't really buy this commercially in any, any fashion, it's still, thanks to the Internet and the many, many fan communities all around, very easy to get set up and running on a modern system. Mr. Copel, Mr. Calavera has something out here that he says he needs your signature on. Ah, oh, cripes, Ava! Just sign it yourself, will you? I'm busy! You'll have to excuse him, Manny. It's probably a really hard crosswood puzzle he's got in there today. Eva, I'm impressed. I had no idea you had this kind of power. Well, we all have our secrets. You know, some people complained about the amount of smoking in the game. <laughs> uh, the developers had a pretty nice response to that. They said, For those who are disturbed by the amount of smoking in Grim Fandango, we offer two reasons. One, we wanted it to be true to the film noir atmosphere. And two, everybody in the game who smokes is dead. Think about it. Hey, I look good in this, don't I? <laughs> yeah. 
Yeah, well, they say black is slimming. I'm driving, yeah, I'm driving. <laughs> ah, good old Tim Schafer. I was playing Brutal Legend the other day, and I was uh, really reminded of uh, this game and the, the sort of Tim Schafer style, especially his uh, love of these big hot rods and go-karts and unusual vehicles. This next part of the game, to me, is really special. It's, I don't know what really to call it other than art, pop art, modern art, uh, Dadaism, you know, whatever word you want to call it. I call it, it's very surreal. Uh, to me, this is the land of the living. And it's got to be one of the most bizarre-looking things I've ever seen in a game, period. I mean, I mean, look at that. I mean, here's what it reminded me of. This is Richard Hamilton's Just What Is It That Makes Today's Home So Different, So Appealing. You're not going to find many games with references like this. Bound only by the paper-thin wrapper of mortality, a soul here lies, struggling to be free, and so it shall. Thanks to a bowl of bad gazpacho. Look I mean, it's no wonder this game has is, is attracted such a cult following, right? I mean, what, what other game looks like this? Now, what I'm supposed to be doing is using my, uh, my scythe on this guy's you know, cocoon or whatever that thing is he, he's wrapped in. Unfortunately, I could never seem to remember uh, what button did what on the gamepad. The movement part's easy, but remembering what button uh, is set to what uh, for some reason gave me lots of trouble. <laughs> Nice bathroom. You know, I love this, the voice of this little guy here. He reminds me of Yosemite Sam from uh, the Bugs Bunny cartoons. Several travel package upgrades if you'd care to cut the yeah. I want something cheap where I can get some rest and that's it. Now, the way this place works is when, you're, when you die, uh, your loved ones put some money and some stuff in your coffin with you, and then you can use that money in this uh, place here to get to the your ultimate destination by like a luxury cruise liner or, or a train if you're if you've been really bad though and you've got no cash then you have to basically walk now, there's a lot more going on I'm not gonna go I'm not gonna uh, spoil it for you uh, but that'll just give you some basic idea and uh, needless to say our guy has done something really horrible Manny although he doesn't remember what it is. But it's something bad. Before the next sales report comes in, you're out! Out on the street, no job, no way to work off your time. Just your fancy suit and your big smile and a whole lot of time to kill! Who you calling a scumbag? Why, well, I ought to... Here's one of the early puzzles of the game. Now, what's happened here is I've, I've been given enough clues to know that I need to find some way to disrupt the quote-unquote server system, this pneumatic system of sending these capsules with messages in them around the office building. But it's kind of up to you to figure this solution out. Now, the way the game is set up, though, you really need to pay careful attention to the cutscenes, the stuff that happens in between... Uh, gameplay segments because it clearly gives you all the clues that you'll need to solve whatever puzzles coming up uh, So for example, I, I've seen the packing foam I, that cutscene. I just showed you uh, we know what it does uh, It's not too hard to put two and two together and figure out that you know, maybe you need to uh, manipulate that system somehow to flood the uh, the server pumps I guess what I, I like about this game and really about any well-designed adventure game is that although the developers have put in a lot of clues and a lot of foreshadowing, hints, uh, whatever you want to call it, it always feels like you're the one that's come up with a solution. I think that's why the appeal of these games is, has been limited. Because there's just, you know, not everybody has that kind of level of satisfaction with basically what amounts to an intellectual problem. I know you talk to, talk to a, a programmer or somebody who likes math and they'll talk about how enjoyable it is when... They've been struggling with this problem for hours, days, if not longer, and then when they suddenly, just in a flash of insight, arrive at the solution. That's a wonderful thing for them. You know, and of course, uh, another problem that was really becoming a big issue for adventure games at this time was the Internet. In uh, 1998, uh, obviously, the, uh, the Internet wasn't as ubiquitous. You know, not everybody 
had it had access to it at this time a lot of um, gamers would have just had to figure these puzzles out on their own uh, but this was it was getting to the point though the saturation level where anytime somebody got lost confused frustrated I think you just hop on a website and get the the answer quickly instantly and unfortunately it's it's very hard to resist that temptation to do that but if you do it the level of of enjoyment you're going to get from an adventure game just goes down to nil. Uh, you just lose all interest in it. It's not even a 10% of the game that it would have been if you would have just uh, stuck to it. Uh, so that's, I think, not just a problem for Grim Fandango, but for all adventure games. And I really encourage you, if you haven't played this before and you're playing it now, just whatever it takes, uh, just rip out, <laughs> you know, turn off your router, uh, remove yourself from any internet presence uh, whatsoever and even if it takes if you get stuck on a puzzle and you can't figure it out for hours even days uh, just you know sleep on it come back uh, the next day and uh, the solution might might pop up and i guarantee if you'll just just wait it out and solve it manually no matter how long it takes you're going to have a lot more pleasure out of adventure games i mean these games are based on a deficit of information so you don't know what you need to know to win it if you artificially reduce that gap, uh, you've ruined the game. I mean, it's, that's <laughs> anyway, I've said enough on it. Uh, try to resist the urge and you'll like it better. I, I kind of messed up here in a, in a bad way, and the developers really punish you for this. So, you know, you've seen what I've done here. I've, I've blocked up the server. Uh, the maintenance guy is here now fixing it. Uh, the way they got this door set up, there's a little deadbolt on it. And if you do the puzzle without activating that deadbolt, then he gets out and you have to do all of these steps again. There's quite, <laughs> quite a few steps, a good you know, 10, 10 minutes, maybe 15 minutes worth of work. So well, there's a lot of those kind of moments in this game, which I guess you either love or hate. I mean, when I figured out how badly I had screwed up here, <laughs> I was livid. Oh, God, it was bad. But yeah, that's what you're supposed to do. Okay, so watch what happens now that I got the little deadbolt activated. Good enough for government work. Hey, when you figure all this out and you get this guy out of here, <laughs> you're just so pleased with yourself. It's good. That was a company car. Oh, yeah. And it's even better company now. I'm in. <laughs> Oh, yeah. <laughs> oh, oh, oh. Oh, what's not to like about... If you don't like this game, get the hell out of here. Buenos dias. You're not the nurse? No. You're not here to give me my medication? No, but I am here to ease your pain. Guess they couldn't save me, huh? No, but there's still a chance you could save me. And the plot's about to thicken. What makes you think I've been all that good? Where are you taking me? To the headquarters of the LSA. LSA? Yes, you probably suspected all along. Things are not what they seem, and there's more to this game than just getting our Reaper friend here a, a ticket on a first-class cruise. No, he's got to, I don't know if save the world is quite the right phrase here, but he's got to uncover this huge conspiracy. It's going to take a lot of doing. It's going to take him all over the place. But I uncovered a web of corruption in our beloved Department of Death. I have reason to believe that the Bureau of Acquisitions is cheating the very souls it was chartered to serve. Manny, until now we scraped along the ground like rats. But from now on we soar. Like eagles. <laughs> like eagles on... Pogo sticks! There's so many great moments in this game, but th but this puzzle, this uh, next puzzle I'm going to show you is probably my my favorite in the game. It's not quite giant rats, but it's pretty close. It's demonic beavers. Manny, what are you doing? Don't you know what's on the other side of that gate? Yeah, the way out of the forest. Demon beavers, Manny. 
they'll make you into a dam. Relax, Geppetto. I'm not made of wood. But Manny, they don't use wood. Oh, you thought beavers weren't intimidating? They're usually pretty ferocious, especially when they're on fire. <laughs> I would wrap up with what must be one of the best transitions ever, at least in terms of video games. I remember this moment distinctly from the last time I played this game, several years ago. I'll just let it play out. I don't really want to do that. Celso, your wife sailed out of here two months ago with another man. It's all in there. Oh, Manny. Is there a greater constant in nature than the treachery of women? Forget about her, Celso. Have you forgotten yours? I'm going after her. You take over my job here. This mop at least will never let you down. That compass in the handle will sure come in handy too! That's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. Should be back next week with a brand new interview series, this time with Janelle Jaquais. Now, Janelle is a fantastic artist. I have one of her prints hanging in the Match Hat studio. I love her work. She's done a lot of great work and a lot of great games. It's a really good interview, so stay tuned for that. I know you guys are going to love it. As always, I want to thank you. If you have donated and supported the show, it really means a lot to me, and it's keeping these episodes coming. So if you haven't donated, or you haven't donated in a, in a while, uh, just go to armchairarcade.com, follow the Matt Chat links. only takes a few minutes and makes a really, really big difference. So thank you guys very much. Now what about that Ale of the Week? Now this is the last of Herbert selections. I'm going to be very, <laughs> very sad when this is gone. I've uh, greatly enjoyed these. And you know, thanks again, Herbert. I mean, there are fans, and then there are fans who will send you six bottles of excellent ale. <laughs> you know, whole new level. I uh, really appreciate it. I mean, I've really enjoyed the hell out of these, man. But this time we've got something called uh, Dogma. It's got a 7.8% alcohol by volume, so it shouldn't be too bad. L brewed with honey, cola nut, poppy seed, and marijuana. Uh, no, wait, wait, that's Gorana. <laughs> I have my hopes up there for a minute. It smells really good. Let's give it a taste. Mm, very smooth, very sweet. Um, maybe, uh, so, maybe, <laughs> this is kind of a strange taste going on in this. Let me, let me give it another, another taste. Maybe that agaran is getting to me. <sighs> yeah, so this is very interesting. You know, so it tastes like your regular sort of dark ale, black ale going down, but then there's like this aftertaste that's really odd. You know, not in a bad way. I'm going to try this one more time, see if I can describe that aftertaste. I mean, this is really exotic stuff. Okay, so what am I tasting here, right? You know, I just, I just can't describe uh, what this sort of aftertaste is like. It's very in intense. I mean, it's practically making my eyes water here. Um, there's definitely some unusual ingredients <laughs> in this dogma. Holy cow. Ah. Hope I can get through this quotation. Thankfully, it's mercifully short. It goes uh, something like this. Never call a man happy until he is dead. Said by the playwright Aeschylus. See you guys next week. Sing a little bit of that song, why don't you? Well, I only have this part. Bone wagon. I like it. <laughs>